at the end of the night, I remember it would have been probably about 20 past 11 and I was thinking, okay, I've got a few big pots to wash. And then I'm so excited about what, what we've achieved here today. I can't wait to get home and tell my wife, Kim, and my children, you know, all about it. And then I heard this very posh voice behind me saying, excuse me, chef, excuse me, chef. And I turned around and it was Prince Harry. And Prince Harry said, uh, oh, chef, what a lovely meal. Thank you very much. Now, how do I get outside? This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There are many in the industry that have spent their entire careers refining and evolving their interpretation of hospitality. Some open to new ideas, others sit in their ways, believing their way is the road to success and longevity. But along comes a pandemic and forces you to rethink everything you do. For some, it's not necessarily a bad situation to be in. Stephen Clark is the owner of Clarks of North Beach in Western Australia. Stephen, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Good. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, WA didn't have any cases for 10 months, and um, here we are in a five-day lockdown. Um, How are you feeling right now? Um, I feel okay. I feel, um, I think we've all had a bit of practice from last year, haven't we? What's what's been the initial reaction um, from you and your establishments uh, with the lockdown? I think a lot of people have um, already had in place the whole takeaway procedure. Um, those of the small restaurants like ours that uh, are really the social hub of their community, they really are the suburban restaurant. And I think um, it's uh, it's an opportunity and I'm quite looking forward to um, – seeing our guests should this last a lot longer than five days uh you know to come and pick up their takeaway you've uh, had clarks for over 18 years now but it's a very different proposition to what it was just 12 months ago has the, the last 12 months changed the way you approach the restaurant and what you're doing absolutely look um when this first came around we had a uh, lots of um things on we were going to uh, Canberra to feed the Prime Minister and represent Western Australia uh, to feed a thousand people using all beautiful Australian ingredients that was um, that was really excitable and obviously that got cancelled which was a real shame but just as a lead up to the first whole COVID situation my dad passed away on the 16th or the 3rd of um, March Uh, so I took my family to uh, the funeral which was on the 16th of March in England and, um, you know, we, we got to the funeral and then when we got back to the uh, airport to return, we'd lost our tickets, which was really sad. <laughs> we, we were stuck in England and uh, it took us a couple of weeks to get back. But uh, as soon as we got back, we were one of the first days of hotel quarantine. That was a real eye opener for me because, you know, you thought, wow, this is um, this is totally different. Uh, and then, of course, the restaurant was shut at that point for... Uh, as everyone's restaurant was, and it was uh, at first quite frustrating to say, look, we do fine dining food. We uh, we really enjoy the artistry of putting it on a plate. But I had two weeks in the hotel to contemplate how to go about takeaway uh, up to our standard. And um, I come out of there after two weeks with a plan. The very following day, I was straight at work, and we launched our takeaway menu. And um, to be quite honest, It went so well. And what was really lovely was to realise what we meant to the community in North Beach. That that was was super special to think, wow, and that made what we do worthwhile. Sometimes as a chef, you know, you can hide in the kitchen and make one creative dish after another, but you never really get to enjoy time with the customers. And it might seem strange with the whole COVID situations, but it was nice to, to see people smile and let them, um, you, you know, let the food speak for itself. And, and it was so lovely to uh, think that so many of our customers had their children serving them at the table. They'd set up a table at home with a tablecloth and all their finest uh, cutlery and crockery. Uh, and yeah, a three-course takeaway menu. From that. That, was, that was awesome. Well, Clarks of North Beach made a, an, an amazing impact and real name for itself for the finer end of dining, as you say. Can you sort of Give us a picture of what it was before the pandemic and and how the restaurant is operating now. Uh, how, how we were before the pandemic, we were tablecloth, 
table, very quite a fine dining, old school. I'd say it was old school with some modern twists along the way. I am a bit of a traditionalist, but I do believe, and I think the secret in our restaurant is to uh, look at a new, a new um, when something new comes up, you, you know, you've got to have a look at it and you say, is it better than the old way? And a lot of them are just a fad. But uh, I'll take, it might seem strange, but I'll take what I think is worth taking from a new style and add that to our more classical um, style of approach. But we, we've always been very popular with a, a tasting menu. Like if you like our degustation menu has always been very popular. We did do some really nice a la carte dishes as well, um, which was all, obviously all before the whole lockdown. We, we were, we've always been successful. We've always been very busy. But um, with this lockdown came new rules and new procedures. And to be quite honest, it was nice to get my wife back into the dining room after an av- uh, you know, absent years of um, working in the dining room. She was been doing all the books and everything, obviously, for 18 years and, uh, and uh, keeping us all strong, which she does so well. But um, it was, it's been really nice to work with the whole family because as a family unit, we all work there. So my son works in the kitchen with me. My daughter works in the my uh, niece one works in the front. My sister-in-law makes all of our bread and everything else like that. So it, it really is a family, um, a family dining restaurant. When I say family dining, I mean family run dining room, which was, which was great. And um, we've been chipping away for a long time, um, you know, doing what we do. And then come this pandemic, we, we got an opportunity to stop, have a good look at the business what's working and what's not working financially and that was the biggest question and we had, did have a wage bill there this tiny little suburban restaurant of four hundred thousand dollars a year which is a, a considerable sum at the time you th- i'd like to dub, double everyone's wages anyway that's the person i am but uh, when you work it out you think my word we've got to work you know that's crazy and uh, since this pandemic what we've done is we've uh, purchased some new tables which is smaller which makes people feel more comfortable with the social distancing. Um, beautiful wood one. So we've got rid of the tablecloths. Believe it or not, that was a twenty to $24,000 a year exercise just in the laundry cost. To uh, So that, that's been a, a big saving. Uh, and it's been on my mind for a long time to maybe change from what we used to do with the tablecloth service. Because obviously that twenty four thousand is only the start of it. Then of course you've got the the staff costs of the guys ironing them and everything else like that. That all probably that again in 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 labour. So it was an opportunity to have a good change, and that's what we did. And we thought right as soon as the government said you can now open as a restaurant, we thought well let's do what we do best that everyone comes and fingers crossed enjoy or at least gets a taste of what we can do. And that is a seven course tasting menu. And that's what we've been running now for, I think it's about eight months. It's been, uh, we only, we are now only open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which is a bit of a, a shock to the system to a lot of people. But uh, because we've got all family members working there now as well, it's sort of changed our hours, but uh, which has obviously changed the income quite considerably. But to be quite honest, it's been a matter of, um, working out your costs, you know, and, and turning around and saying, now this, all of a sudden, well, three days of fully booked seven course tasting menu where we get to play. It's it's just this beautiful play every night. It's read. The script is the same every day, but it always ends up slightly different. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been thoroughly enjoyable to, to have all your family at work with you. Um, and, and like I said, now we take less money, but we actually make more money with all the margins and everything else like that. So that's been a profitable exercise really as well. You mentioned earlier that your restaurant at its base is more old school, but you like to adapt and evolve when it fits. Could you give us an idea of how much your food has changed and perhaps something that's on the menu now to give an example of where you're at with your food? Okay. Look, before we'd said like a, you know, a lemon tart, for example, it's a it's a fantastic dessert. I still believe it's a, it's one of the, it can be one of the best desserts you've ever tasted, as long as that tart's fresh. We've always um, had food like that on. We've gone from fillet steak, uh, you know, traditional fillet steak, to trying different cuts of 
the animal now, like for example, using the Wagyu tri-tip, the Rosemary tri-tip, which is uh, absolutely sensational. Um, different different cuts. Uh, we've before, when I said before we were traditionalists, we 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 won so many awards at the restaurant, which um, has, has been been amazing. But what always what I love to do is uh, get involved with young people. Like uh, when you take some uh, a person on, they have so many ideas, and you know, so they, a lot of people, a lot of young people, have come to the restaurant. And say, oh, chef, we have to have foie gras and caviar, and, and you sort of think, okay, now I don't want to crush this person's enthusiasm, but I know it's not going to work. But unfortunately, when you're a business, you have to let them find out themselves. So you go and you purchase that, and then you, you explain to them. So they can see themselves. Otherwise, a lot of young people, we're, we have a very creative mind as chefs. And if you don't let them fuel that creativity, then obviously they, they'll go somewhere else. So it's important to um, keep, keep the young generation of chefs coming through. And that's something I've been really lucky to do to have had some of Perth's best chefs out there um, have come from Clark's. And that's something my wife and I are so proud of to think, well, a little family restaurant has put young people into the best restaurant in the world into in with um heston blumenthal or gordon ramsay and you think wow how did we do that that's uh, you know a, a, and, and it's by the enthusiasm that you have and the relationship that you have with these young people uh, and their ideas that keep you young and keep the fresh things coming and i think that's important not to lose that that connection that you have with the next generation has uh, seen you enter competitions all over the world, win so many different competitions and have so many accolades. Do you have any stories from all the different things that you've been involved with in regards to that? Yeah, look, uh, I, I was so lucky to have been, um, I'd won, I did my very first competition with my very, one of my very first apprentices in Sydney. And uh, my wife said, Sydney, why, we're in Perth, why are you going to Sydney? I said, Kim, what if what if we're absolutely terrible and we look really bad? At least we're in Sydney where no one's going to know us. So we, we entered this competition, which was one chef and one apprentice to cook a three-course meal in 90 minutes. And uh, it doesn't sound very difficult, but when you're in that environment, it's uh, not the easiest thing. So we packed up every pot and pan, uh, every piece of equipment that we'd need to cook for this beautiful, beautiful three-course meal, my apprentice uh, and I. We took off to uh, Sydney. We rented a beautiful apartment, you know, and uh, we had everything we could need. We, we had, I think we spent about $1,500 in excess baggage <laughs> to enter this competition. So we showed up this competition and I'd done this, you know, Parisian potatoes, which is, is it takes a specific sort of scoop. We call it a noisette scoop. Um, so it's this tiny little scoop that will scoop a potato out into a beautiful, perfect ball. And uh, that was the only thing that we'd forgotten. And I, I saw a friend there in Sydney and I said, listen, do you have a Prisian scoop we could borrow? And he said, of course, yeah, I'll lend it to you. So he gave it to my apprentice. So we, you know, to cut a long story short, we entered the competition. Time was on. And I said to uh, my apprentice, right, it's time for the potatoes. Where's the scoop? Where did you put the scoop? I think he spent 20, about 22 minutes looking for this scoop. And all the judges were hovering around. Uh, uh, like there's a problem in his kitchen. So they were all hovering around and I was getting more and more nervous. And then I said, Garth, please find that scoop. Where is the scoop, girl? And then he put his hand in his pocket and he said, Chef, it was in your pocket. <laughs> Bless him. But uh, that was such a such a fun thing to do. I think as soon as we finished the competition, we walked out of there and uh, literally had one beer and then fell asleep. We were so exhausted. But uh, we were so lucky to have won that competition as well. So that, I think that got me started within the whole competition um, scene in, in Australia. Uh, and I came back and then my wife said, I've entered you in Chef of the Year here, which is an annual competition to uh, to uh, run, you know, to enter Chef of the Year. And I said, oh, Kim, really? And that was a few weeks afterwards. So I entered that and, you know, you know, so lucky to win that as well and, won it for three years in a row which you couldn't enter anymore so that set me set me on to a, a path of working cleaner uh, making sure everything is exacting and precise and uh, I got to meet some amazing people and become a member of the Australian national cooking team 
which saw us go to Singapore, um, Thailand, uh, you, you know, several times to, to Singapore and all over Australia. So I've seen every state in Australia except uh, the Northern Territory all through the team. But I'll tell you one thing, and as all the kitchens look exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, you have cooked all over the globe and – at one stage, you were a personal chef to the Earl and Countess of Leicester. What was that like? That was unbelievable. Um, you know, I met my wife in 1989, and um, we immigrated here. My wife um, had two children from a previous marriage, and we've all been together since 89. So, you know, at the, you know, we all, we're all one. We're, we're all a big family. So we had two more children, uh, and in the year of 2000, there was, seemed to be a big change in the air, you know, this whole t- year 2000. And we thought, well, we've been in Australia for um, six years. Our parents and grandparents are getting older. It'd be lovely to go and introduce the two children and maybe spend a year there. So um, I uh, we left. We rented our house out, you know, and, uh, and on a whim and a prayer went to England for a year. And I was so lucky to secure the job as the, the personal chef to the Earl and Countess of Leicester in Holcombe Hall, which turns out to be uh, Britain's most famous shooting venue. And that was, uh, so that was all sorts of game. It was the most magic uh, experiences any chef could have to turn around and say every ingredient that you're going to present is caught or farmed on that estate. And, you know, to the... Um, the first week I was there, I'll never forget it. The um, I said to the butler, "Oh, you know, I'd like to meet all the staff, sir. How do I? What do you think is the best way to go about it?" He said, "We have morning tea at eleven o'clock upstairs, Stephen." He said, "So why don't you make some cookies and come up and say hello?" So I came upstairs to, you know, with this tray of cookies to meet all the staff, and it was really interesting because so many of them were in their sixties, and their grandparents had worked for that the previous Earl of Leicester you know which and and I'm sure their grandchildren will be working for the next Earl of Leicester so it really was a a great opportunity to go into into this environment and I'll never forget the conversation in the staff room and it was it was quite amazing about the Queen coming for dinner she came to open the um, the shooting the first day of shooting with her husband Prince Philip and that was that was something else to think that you're in a position where, you know, that um, th- that was going to happen on the weekend and it was your first weekend on the job. Absolutely terrified when, when um, they said, right, now we're going to, because we start the shooting, the birds won't be from here. We, they're coming down from Scotland and we're going to do grouse. And I said, I've never done grouse before for the Queen. And the butler said, don't worry, Stephen, I'll make sure you get it right. But thank goodness we did, and um, it was uh, an amazing opportunity to um, to cook for for everybody that I cooked for when I was there. We would um, a typical week would be cooking for Lord and Lady during the week. Uh, they'd give me the list of who's coming and what allergies and bits and bobs that would be happening on the weekend, and then we'd compose a menu over the three days, and that was. Um, that was great to turn around and say to use woodcock and, you know, all these different birds that you'd never seen or had the opportunity to use before and then to be um, look really from the state. That was something else. You know, so, Lord, Lord, I'll never forget. I've still got the um, little slips from Lord Leicester where you'd go in and he'd already be out for the day. And it'd say, Stephen, there's a brace of pheasants in the game larder from the Queen. Please dress for dinner. And you think that's not every day the Queen sends over some pheasants, and but um, yeah, so that was that was an opportunity that like no other. And one of my special um, moments in my career, I guess, was obviously there. There were so many, but um, this one particular, the Lord and Lady Leicester had invited the boys. No one say the boys, William and Harry, to come as guest of honours for the New Year's Eve Reed Dance that they held every year. And uh, the phone rang in the kitchen, as it does in every household, and it was um, Prince Charles's personal secretary, and she explained who she was and that she was looking for Lady Leicester. So I tore around the house trying to find Lady Leicester, which I tell you now, it's a big house. But 
I finally found her and I said, Mom, I've so-and-so on the phone and they want to talk to you. And Lady Lester just stopped and said, I bet they want to bloody well come now, don't they, Wonder? Because she nicknamed me Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and I was like, what? Because obviously the talk in the house was we'd invited the boys. And then I witnessed Lady Lester on the telephone and in a very um, royal way, dress down this poor person on the other end of the phone and then uh, conclude the phone call with, we would love to see them. Um, their friends are all coming. If ever you receive a um, a letter with our letterhead on the top of it, please make sure it gets to who it's intended and not just a repetitive no from the, from, uh, the office. And I thought, wow, that's how to tell someone off without swearing. That was that was so great. But uh, And then, you know, to have William and Harry there for on New Year's Eve was was just brilliant. At the end of the night, I remember it would have been probably about 20 past 11 and I was thinking, OK, I've got a few big pots to wash and then I'm so excited about what, what we've achieved here today. I can't wait to get home and tell my wife, Kim, and my children, you know, all about it. And then I heard this very posh voice behind me saying, excuse me, chef, excuse me, chef. And I turned around and it was Prince Harry. And Prince Harry said, uh, oh, chef, what a lovely meal. Thank you very much. Now, how do I get outside? And I was like, I was like, wow, I was honoured that, that, you know, I, was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, so I took him to servants' quarters all the way around to get him outside so I could have a little chat to him. I think that would be probably one of the highlights of my career would have been that one. Well, the food that you were doing there uh, and access to such amazing game is very different to Australia. What was it like coming here and using WA produce? Oh, look, uh, from, from, oh, yeah, oh, that was uh, completely different at the time. I mean, this was 2001. And uh, Lord Lester said to me, look, uh, what do you want to do, Stephen? Because, uh, you know, th- th- with us, we- we're going to need you four months in the year. I said, OK. He said, but look, I have a good friend who's looking for a personal chef. And that was the uh, founding member of Mercedes Benz, the founding family, the Flick family. They, uh, what an amazing opportunity to have a- an interview there as well with this chap. And I couldn't believe the opportunities that, that would have come from that. But uh, I got that job and then I got home and my father said, what are you going to do, Stephen? And I said, well, in six months, we'd like to go back to Australia. He said, do you think it's sincere to take a position with this gentleman where your first trip away is to the new house in Monaco? And I I said, "Uh, yeah, okay, Dad, you're right. (laughs) But uh, coming back back to, to Britain from working in these prestigious um establishments and things like that was um it was an eye opener i uh, applied for a job as a in a wedding reception venue out in the swan valley and uh, i went for the interview and uh, it was just a, the owner stood on top of this pile of dirt just down by the swan river and said this is going to be the the biggest uh, cantilever waterfall in the southern hemisphere it's going to be three tiers of uh, uh, you know, terrace gardens, and and I sort of thought, blimey, this. And, and you know, it was when I left. I think I still think Cavisham House is probably the most majestic and beautiful place to get married. Uh, I had an opportunity to work there for eighteen months, and uh, I enjoyed myself. But I found myself working a lot of hours. And it's funny because when you work for the Royal Family, there's no, you can't have an off day. And all of a sudden, the next position you take is doing weddings every every day there's a service it's somebody's wedding so again it's another stressful environment where you couldn't get anything wrong so uh the i'd work i'd often clock up an awful lot of hours there and that was the point when i thought you know um it's time to uh, maybe think about your own restaurant and um that's what happened with clark's and um, at that time you know i think wa has always had some absolutely beautiful ingredients but uh, there's a few mysterious things we do, like freeze the shellfish at sea. We, you know, this sort of business where in Europe, it, it just seems so much more elegantly uh, presented to you as a chef to what we receive here in Western Australia. But I do one of the most beautiful ingredients that I've ever had the opportunity to use is, is marin, uh, you know, from uh, Pemberton. And I still think that is absolutely the best ingredient that we do Mind you, having said that, our stone fruit is also something else. I think really they are, for me, the two key ingredients within Western Australia. 
But uh, again, as a chef, you're only as good as the ingredients that you're putting on a plate. So you've got to make sure that you do use uh, the best that you can buy. You need to make sure that uh, you're thorough with um, with your costings because otherwise, obviously, it'll be an absolute blowout. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, I think as Western Australia stands today, I think we've got so many boutique, beautiful companies opening up um, with some fantastic ingredients. We just unfortunately saw a few of them go during COVID, which was one of them was a, a lovely lamb company that uh, got um, to work for exclusively. And they um, it was called Motenai Lamb, which is Japanese for sustainable. And it became the most sustainable meat in the world where everything that the animal had or took to was from that from that farm, from the wind turbines. And what was so different about this this lamb is they would graze it to 60 kilos and not to 45 or to 42, which was the standard. And uh, it would it was grazed on 90 uh, percent of its feed was olives from olive husks and uh, press to uh, carrots. So raw ca- reject carrots and the carrot juice and things like that. And it, at first we sort of thought, wow, it's a bit different, but it became known as the Wagyu of lamb. And uh, they they were supplying some of the best kitchens in the world. And that was from Lancelin in WA. And they approached me to say, look, we've got, um, we want to showcase in now in Dubai. And we've got this big dinner where um, we've there's going to be something like, I think it was 11, 11 Michelin stars at the table they wanted to audition to, which one of them was the inventor of the edible balloon at Alinea, which was, and we want to do um, a seven course meal with five of the courses being our lamb. So off I trotted to uh, Dubai to try and impress these chefs, which was, uh, which was uh, you know, we, we, we did the first few courses were all precise and very exacting and looking, if you like what we use the term, very sexy on the plate. And then we, we finished with just this braised roasted shoulder and we served that with the most beautiful Greek salad. And all the chefs just looked at each other and just put their phones down and started, the conversation started. And it was it was really a magic moment, to be honest. So I was quite impressed to be working with, with, with those guys. We've done an awful lot of work now with Rose Malley, which is a new company here in Western Australia, doing the beef. And they also do the Akoya oyster as well, which is quite fun. 18 years is amazing for a restaurant. And, uh, you know, there's many more to come for the, for Clark's. But how, how have you seen the WA restaurant scene evolve in the last two decades? I think it's changed an awful lot from us being, if you like, um, a lot of – when we go to the Good Food Guide back in the day, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was – so many restaurants with tablecloths, very, very quite a formal style where I've seen it completely change now to, if you like, very casual, um, which in, in a way, you know, one of the first lessons that you learn when you cook is you have to cook for your customers. You have to no good having the best, you know, the best fine dining restaurant if you're stuck in the middle of a council estate. It's not going to happen. But uh, not to say personal council estate, but you know it's it's a, you have to feed where you are, and I think um, a lot of young restaurateurs are getting it right. I do think there's quite a genetic menu out there, which uh, everybody seems to do very similar dishes. But um, I think really what's changed is is people's perception of food. I think with these uh, t- TV and chefs being seen in. Uh, you know, if you like a, a very popular light in the in the media, I think everyone has a little bit of knowledge of food now. It's been uh, every now and again we would get a vegetarian, where now it's pretty much every night a gluten, dairy, you know, and and uh, an allergy. Some of them which you've never heard of, but um, that's really changed an awful lot. I think is that the dietary requirements is something that I think we has really gotten. Not out of control, but every night we'll have quite a few. You've changed your restaurant quite dramatically in the last year and you're you're taking less money but have a better margin and it seems to be a more sustainable model. Well, have you changed yourself over the, the last year and um, what's the future looking like for you in regards to food? 
I think uh, I think it's it's changed me an awful lot actually. To be honest, the the whole um, procedure, the theatre of of service is obviously different now. You know, um, working with family as well as you can't get too out of control, or when you get home, you'll be in an awful lot of trouble. And it's a long time from uh, Saturday night to Thursday night <laughs> if you're in trouble. But, uh, I think what's changed me, it's given me an opportunity to stop, to reevaluate, to say, well, this is really working. Look at this. This is this is going really well. That We've gotten to a stage where, uh, if you like, um, producers are approaching us to put their product on our menu, which is really nice. But obviously, when you to gain um, relationships with producers – is fantastic, but there's always that terrible sense of guilt when a season comes along where you feel the need to change their product, you know. But uh, for me personally, I think it's given me an opportunity to um, to enjoy other restaurants on the Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, it's um, yeah, it's given me a better sense of um, of uh, of living. Really, I think I've enjoyed uh, doing some more gardening. Believe it or not, I love photography. It's given me an opportunity to uh, to fuel my passion, and there's that sense of wanting to get back in the kitchen and 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 then it, it building up inside, you know, over the days off. That by the time you come back into the kitchen, there's a sense of excitement about it and uh, to welcome in that theatre of the service again. I think that's important because before it was minimum of 70 hours a week was restaurant, and it can drag you down. It can really make you feel, um, if you like, uh, oh, there's got to be more to life than this. Uh, but uh, we're, doing what we're doing is, is really worked and it's given me a great life and home soul balance as well. Well, hopefully uh, the lockdown only lasts a couple of days and you guys can get back on with what you do best. Uh, it's been amazing to talk to you today, mate, and um, some cracking stories from the UK that I'm sure our listeners will enjoy. Uh, Please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Certainly will do. Thank you very much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.